Mr. Fan, you wanted to? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Hi, Audrey. Um, it was great hearing from you. Um, uh, my name is Mustafa. I'm from Pakistan. I um, have a few years of work experience working with the governments, uh, particularly the health department in Pakistan in Punjab, the province Punjab. Um, so I'm very really impressed by how you guys uh, tackled uh, the COVID breakout. And uh, like Stefan said, uh, in Pakistan, it was mostly from a top-down approach, where uh, command and control center was set in um, the federal uh, level, uh, run by doctors and the army. Um, and then um, based on that, uh, different interventions were uh, implemented at the province level. Uh, using the already uh, some of the structure of the health department and uh, some of the resources of the army. Uh, but I'm really uh, curious about uh, if you could uh, talk about in some more detail about how you used this, uh, uh, how you combated the COVID pandemic through mm -hmm. IT. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to hear that in more detail. That would be great. Yeah, Thank certainly, you. certainly. Um, uh, of course, uh, we, we have published um, like a, a lot of papers in Suwon. I, I think our um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, even had a dedicated website uh, called the Taiwan Model of Combating uh, COVID-19 that lists um, a, a lot of like very fine uh, details. So I'll just paste my, my MOFA and uh, health and welfare links uh, respectively to here for further reading. Uh, but to, to summarize, uh, I think uh, what what we have done uh, is trusting the citizens. Instead of ordering citizens what to do, we trust the people on the front line, including health workers and social workers, uh, to understand the situations better than us. So we focus on two things. On um, first, getting the collective intelligence's input in a coherent way to find the common ground of innovation uh, despite the very different lived experiences in urban and rural areas and so on. So this is the first thing. And second, uh, after we got a, a genuinely a good idea, uh, a mask rationing map, a contact tracing stuff, and things like that, uh, we work on amplifying it as quickly as possible using whatever apparatus that there is in preferably 24 hours uh, after we discovered this genuinely good idea. This is so we can pivot. Uh, when, when we first introduce an idea, of course, it's going to have bias, it's going to have unforeseen um, consequences and so on. But if we do this iteration quickly enough, uh, in the CECC, we admit our mistakes very quickly in 24 hours. And uh, the good ideas, they are implemented at most uh, next Thursday. So we do deployment every Thursday, right? So uh, people um, learn this cadence uh, very quickly that their input actually matters. It could just be leading to the fashion brands adopting pink as the uh, color of the day uh, or uh, whatever uh, their their new good ideas are uh, and so we, we treasure people's actual experiences and work on ways to converge them into coherent blended uh, volitions and so of course we leverage existing infrastructures as I alluded to like our universal healthcare IC card uh, which is very important uh, we leverage the fact that the pharmacies and later on convenience store all have uh, secure uh, lines uh, into the administration of health and welfare. Um, um, like I think 90% or more have fiber optic connections and so on. So that help on the real timeness of data because otherwise it would not be trustworthy. Uh, we leverage the kiosk uh, ATM like machines uh, in convenience stores. We repurpose them so they can read those uh, health IC cards and so on. Uh, so we change a lot of IT system and all of them like SMS and QR code uh, exist before the pandemic. So people do not have to learn a new set of norms. It's always technologies adopt, adapting to where people are, never asking the people to adapt to where the technologies are. 
Uh, and so, like my grandma, almost 90 years old, uh, was my focus group, one of my focus groups. Uh, and she recommended her younger friends, 77 years old. And we always make sure that they comprehend these new measures. And they also offer very good feedback. Like when we're uh, about to implement uh, Gao Hongan's idea of pre-registration and broader distributional convenience store, well, we initially had this idea of people can just use their debit card on the ATM to uh, transfer a couple of cents to prove that they are they, who, who they are, uh, and then use the receipt of transferal to redeem the mask uh, that they pre-order, which sounds very good on paper, uh, but um, the, it doesn't work. Uh, Grandma Young, 77 years old, said that she always used a, a paper note to withdraw, uh, to, to wire money out. She only used the ATM to withdraw cash. Uh, because she wants to know that she, after a typo, doesn't transfer her savings out. She feels insecure. Uh, she would instead, instead of her debit card, uh, want to use her health card because it's not linked to her bank account. And she knows that she will uh, lose nothing. And she is okay to pay through coins on the counter to the convenience store uh, on the kind of pre-registration fee and so on. So it, it sounds uh, less efficient, but it's actually the only way to get the elderly on board. Uh, and once we probably credited us, Say very probably it's Grandma Young's idea. Uh, then the seventy-seven years old and sixty years, sixty years old become key opinion leaders, and they teach each other that they can actually now go to a convenience store and use their health card. That's just one anecdote, but I hope it conveyed the feeling. Thank you. So, Audrey, one one key element that we discussed, which was that you know, to a large extent, data stewardship is always also making sure that actually we not just go from data to insight, but from insight to action. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, can you tell us a little bit about this? Because you said it's like a, a fast kind of decision mm -hmm. cycle, right? So you have new new insights that gives you a different perspective on reality, and yes. as a result, you act differently. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you establish that? Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and what does it take to have that kind of um, decision, anyway, rapid decision cycle based upon new uh, input? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we, so this is uh, something that we always needed to do before uh, the pandemic yeah. or, or something uh, more severe happens, right? Because you, you can't really ask people to, to suddenly trust the government, but you can, as a government officials, trust the people before a disaster. And if you build this kind of trust uh, enough, then some of the people eventually trust back, which is the underpinning for this kind of co-creation uh, to work, to turn their insights into action. So um, before the pandemic, since I become the digital minister in 2016, uh, for four years before the pandemic, I've published um, all the meetings that I have with lobbyists and journalists and even internal cross-ministerial meetings that I chair into this Say It website. So anyone can see uh, how digital minister work basically. Uh, and uh, this uh, conversation, uh, with your permission, of course, uh, I will also publish the transcript of our conversations. Uh, but you can prefer if you want to be identified only as audience member, right? So this is not about violating your privacy. This is about making sure that people understand who I'm talking with and what content I'm talking with so that people understand the how of policymaking, the why of policymaking, and never just the what of policies. This is the most important thing. Uh, and once people get into the habit of seeing uh, me talking about emerging technologies and things like that, then we can deploy more advanced platforms so that people can comment uh, on those ideas. Now, when people come out on those ideas, the main worry of public service is that it would just be noise, right? Uh, it would just, um, people are used to things like Facebook, which is the digital equivalent of a nightclub, right? Of uh, very loud music, you have to shout to get heard, addictive drinks, private bouncers that escorts you out, uh, and so on, mental health hazard to, to young people and also adults, let's be frank. So basically, um, it's like the, the nightlife district. Now, don't get 
get me wrong, I'm, I respect the entertainment sector, but I don't think we should have town hall discussions in our local nightclubs, period. So what we need uh, is, this is my office, by the way, this is the Social Innovation Lab, uh, things that are genuinely public infrastructure, like a public park, which is my office, how it's modeled after, or like PTT, the campus that I mentioned at the beginning, and so on. So uh, then we can hold online digital discussions. This is Polis, uh, a free software, uh, free as in freedom, uh, for assistive intelligence powered conversation that is the opposite of anti-social corners of social media. This is the pro-social corner of social media where people compete to find consensus, not conspiracy theories. So in 2015, we started deploying that on national level conversations. And nowadays, it's veritably a public uh, infrastructure because it's police gov.tw, no, no longer the g0v.tw, no longer just in a free software community, uh, but just in the uh, civil service. So any civil servant can start new police conversations just like you can start a Google survey. It, it become an everyday thing, right? So uh, this survey is wiki made, right? People contribute their own survey items. So in 2015, we talked about the Uber case, for example, uh, but we talked about something very specific. These are the facts around people driving to work, picking up random strangers that they met through an app, charging them for it, but they don't have a professional driver license. How do you feel about that? Uh, so we don't talk about ideology like gig economy versus sharing economy or whatever, uh, but we talk about this this practice, uh, okay? Uh, and then we ask people for three weeks, how do you feel about the same facts? You may feel happy, they may feel angry, that's okay. Uh, but uh, after we set up this pro-social conversation, always after three weeks, they converge on real insights based on people's actual feeling and experience that then we take those insights and then we make them into decisions. This is the focus conversation method, the four-step method or ORI method that we use. Now, um, the the user experience, the pe human experience is like this. You see a fellow citizen, uh, they have a sentiment, uh, and you may agree. If you do, your avatar moves toward me. If you don't, your avatar moves away from me. So upvoting and downvoting uh, is portrayed as social distancing, right? Uh, but it's not uh, anything measured by headcount. So even if you mobilize 5,000 people to vote exactly as you do, it's just one dot here. It doesn't increase the area of the K-means cluster. And therefore, it doesn't affect the outcome at all. So trolling doesn't pay. And after all, there's no reply button, so you can't even troll me. <laughs> the only thing you do is um, to, to find uh, some other feelings that convince people across the aisle because we attribute more decision-making power to anything that convince everyone. The more polarized you are in the K-means cluster, if you find something that you and this diagonal uh, person agree, then it counts more to what our shared agenda. And we have a real-time visualization for that. So people agree to disagree on just a few ideological things, like whether it's gig or sharing economy. But people almost all agree with their neighbors on most of the things most of the time that insurance is important. Not undercutting existing meters is important. Empowering local church and temples to form their own fleet to serve the place where taxes don't serve, that's important. Search pricing, very important, and so on and so forth. So when everyone, Uber passengers and taxi passengers uh, and their drivers all agree on these things, we then uh, take this to a multi-stakeholder meeting live streamed and ask Uber and everyone, okay, here is the, the common feeling of the people. Why are you not conforming to the norm? So I, I call this the people-public-private partnership. The people sets the norm. The public amplifies the norm. The private sector, what they just implement the norm. Uh, and this is obviously a success because um, for quite a few years now, Uber is a legal taxi company, the Q Taxi. But we also have local co-op like Donkey Move uh, that works as a social entrepreneur uh, to serve the underserved areas where Uber wouldn't go into. And they uh, share the same multi-purpose taxi act that is co-created by the people. So again, this is something that uh, allays uh, people's fear, uncertainty and doubt and turn their energy of tension into an energy of co-creation thanks to the real-time visualization that people understand that uh, will lead to decisive action. And we do that all before the pandemic. So it counts during the pandemic. Uh, Estefan? Uh, hi, 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 Minister Tang. Thank you for, uh, thank you for your sharing this morning. I, I like your uh what's this um 
comparison of social media to uh, to a nightclub, <laughs> and also how you would. Uh, it would be interesting to see how to your tips on how to facilitate a focus group with your grandmother, with your grandma in it. <laughs> yeah, but my my question really was on your point earlier. A nine two two hotline. So I was wondering on the the back end. Say people can call just to share about anything. Yes. That they have feelings or anxiety mm-hmm. or uh, mm-hmm. yes. inquiries about COVID nineteen. So on the back end, like how do you the mm-hmm. call center? How does it uh, categorize the data? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. How do you put mm-hmm. it into notes, for example, and then how is it consolidated and aggregated mm-hmm. so that it informs the decision making? It's mm-hmm. shared colors, for example, mm-hmm. the mass. So. Uh, I'm interested to see how how, how it's mm-hmm. uh, data, how it's cost consolidated, how it is processed, and then disseminated into relevant decision making. Yeah, the the one nine two two back end uh, is the CHT, uh, our uh, largest telecom. Uh, so they already have very good uh, customer feedback call center systems uh, setting up uh, with an elastic uh, workforce that, as I mentioned, can invite the social sector, the charities. Uh, Ciji, our largest charity on disaster recovery, they do their work internationally as well. They have a lot of very, uh, they're, they're also a, a Buddhist um, uh, organization, right? So they uh, have a lot of compassion, empathy, and so on, and just as part of their, their daily training. So these two factors together uh, is necessary. It's necessary to have a call center that can identify the shared uh, topics that the people were talking about and escalate whatever that's not in the Q&A. But it's equally important for not necessarily Buddhist, but people who train the art of compassion uh, to actually draw out the authentic feelings, not just the rushed um, interpretations, the rushed demands and things like that. Because we know that there's demands. We know that people want more masks. They want vaccines sooner. But what we want is that uh, what's the authentic experience that led to this feeling of shortage. And we what we want is the, the insight. So if you've done um, like experience interview in a service design journey, you know what I'm talking about. What we want is to put people's authentic experience on a map so that we can count the dots and, and see that here is the pain point. We need to work on this, this touch point first. So it's both an art of human communication, but also a science of service design, and both uh, need to be together. Uh, but um, I think GovLab is an uh, expert on this. There's uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, of how to build such uh, technique, social technical systems. So please refer to GovLab to how to set up this kind of teams. I was on mute. Thanks, Audrey. Any other uh, question? I, I have a quick question also, Audrey, with regard to, I mean, this group focuses on also how do we not just get um, data equity, right, mm-hmm. in how data is you know, collected and used, but how do we also get question equity, mm-hmm. right, by which, uh, i.e., who actually determines what the questions are mm-hmm. that uh, um, are getting answered? Mm-hmm. And, and how do you go about that mm-hmm. uh, in a more participatory way? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so wondering whether, Audrey, you have also done some work, not just in generating insight, but actually generating questions. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and mm-hmm. so and so mm-hmm. eager to hear how you know, mm-hmm. any example or how mm-hmm. you've done that. Yeah, we have a, a entire system uh, to do that called the participation offices uh, and uh, collaborative meetings uh, and so on. Uh, and here are the two relevant links. The first is in English, the second should probably work with Google Translate. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the way it works, very simply put, is that each ministry of a dedicated team called participation officers uh, that are in charge of citizen engagement. Now we meet every month and we vote on the two topics per month that we want to have a multi-ministerial conversation about, uh, but it includes all the stakeholders and so on. Now, a popular way to determine what goes on the ballot is to start a petition on join the GOV, the TW, uh, which after you collect 5,000 signatures, demands a ministerial response. But if whatever you're asking is cross-ministerial, for example, a 17-year-old uh, a few years back asked that we ban plastic straws from the 
bubble tea, which is our national drink, uh, take out uh, gradually, right? Uh, but but this is obviously not just the environmental protection administration. It's also the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs, among other interior and so on. So we need to get everyone on board. And that is how the PAs, participation officers, work. Is that once they voted this in, we invite this uh, person who's not yet adult, but she uh, has agenda setting power. Uh, and whomever who want to participate from the 5,000 signature, we invite five from them, uh, but the other 4,000, they can watch through live stream and participate through Slido. Uh, and then we map out the stakeholders and we discover how to uh, kind of phase out plastic straws gradually and we uh, turn that into action and people can always go back to see the transcript and things like that in the collaborative meetings. Now, what we found is that we deliberately assign into the breakout groups, the facilitators, the unrelated ministries. So when we talk about the plastic straw, uh, maybe the um, uh, unrelated ministry like the, um, I don't know, Coast Guard uh, host the conversation. Uh, because Coast Guard is on the business end, right? They deal with the, the uh, result <laughs> of the, the, the plastic straws, uh, but they are not directly involved in the policy uh, making stage. Or uh, when we talk about taxi, uh, sorry, tax service reform, how to file our income tax, which was, according to the petitioner, and I quote, explosively hostile to Linux and Mac users. End of quote. Uh, <laughs> we invite uh, not the tax agency, uh, but maybe the Ministry of Culture uh, to hold a breakout group. But when we talk about after the ocean policy, fishing and so on, then we invite a tax and culture agency people as the breakout group. So you get a feeling. Basically, um, those people, they also surf or fish in their spare time. Uh, the Coast Guard, uh, again, maybe they buy a bubble drink. The Ministry of Culture person, uh, they file their tax themselves. So in, in their daily life, they're also citizens negatively affected by bad policies. It's not that just because they're civil service, they have to defend everything, right? For unrelated ministries, they are uh, every bit as mad as other petitioners. Now, for the petitioners who actually join and people watch online, the energy is someone with deep knowledge Knowledge of how civil service work, somehow advocating for their cause. And they, they never seen this before, right? Their counter expertise doesn't have public administration experience. The public administration always defend whatever existing policy is. But the administration officer is a rare blend of the two. And so uh, we can find uh, workable solutions on those questions as raised by the popular vote of the uh, petitions almost uh, always. So sometimes the solution exists on the civil service. Sometimes it uh, resides on the social sector. Sometimes it means we need to pressure Facebook together and uh, threaten social sanction. But whomever is accountable for the change, it's very clear that the civil service are also citizens. And this is how the system should work. Great. Any uh, questions from the cohort here? Yes, please, please. Yeah, I have no, me. I'm not used already to Google, uh, um, and so <laughs> I have no idea on how to navigate uh, or even sure, sure. Uh, see yeah, how to Just so. unmute and speak. Yeah, this should be a call yes, to action. That's, that's unmute you yourself. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? in America. Um, we also have a lot. One of the Old age or in really exciting to.
in your role. I have. You know, mm -hmm. you can go out in the moment. You mm -hmm. know, are they? They mm -hmm. have access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you lie. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. A very important question. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the the indigenous people in Taiwan um, also uh, have a shorter shorter uh, lifespan. Uh, I I don't have the exact number. Uh, maybe six seven years uh, compared to the average of population. Uh, as a result, uh, when we started vaccination, uh, they get uh, a 10 year kind of discount, uh, right? So even if they're younger, they qualify for the uh, older age group. Uh, so uh, by 10 years. Uh, so that's that's the first thing. Um, and uh, the, the second thing is that we ensure because it's universal health care, it's at no cost to them anyway. Uh, we, we bring the vaccination to them. Everyone else need to pre-register uh, and go to the vaccination spot. Uh, but for the indigenous uh, people, nations, uh, we, we uh, do the reverse. Uh, so uh, we just bring the entire vaccination uh, in a kind of mobile uh, delivery uh, fashion uh, and bring to them. Uh, we later on would also do that for the very, very old people. Uh, but I think the indigenous uh, nations receive that uh, mobile vaccination first, uh, if I'm not uh, remembering wrong. So that's the second thing. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, uh, I think this in, inequity um, is about a cultural inequity. Uh, a lot of our vaccination or mask rationing or whatever information, um, I, I must admit, is only bilingual. Uh, they're available in Mandarin and in English, uh, which is strictly speaking wrong because we have 20 national languages here uh, and 16 of which are indigenous. Uh, so by law, the National Language Act, we should provide at least machine translation or interpreter to the 16 languages. The fact is that we do not yet have sufficient natural language processing um, data uh, to produce reliable translation that we uh, are uh, sure that will not um, inadvertently harm people. Uh, but we are working on that, uh, on the so-called low resource languages using transfer learning. For example, Amis have a lot of people, Sakilaya is somehow related to Amis, linguistically very important to know this, uh, different nation linguistically. Uh, but we, we must now work with the experts to do transfer learning so that machine learning that works here will also work here. This is one of our uh, most important investments and it qualifies as uh, infrastructure money, even though it's not made out of concrete, but just of bits uh, in the next couple of years and so on. And I think when culturally uh, they feel that uh, they speak in their kind of native uh, language about how vaccines work and can freely remix uh, the cute dog memes or whatever, I think that will also lead uh, to more kind of self-awareness of how as a nation uh, we're going to negotiate our vaccination uh, with the central government uh, semi-diplomatically. Uh, that is the, the end goal. Uh, but uh, language and cultural equity, uh, in addition to the education and broadband equity that we already have, I think need to happen before that happens. Hope that answers your question. You said something in the kind of what you refer to that is that if, if you know if you have a cultural or language barrier and you also have a particular barrier, but how do this play out in the collective intelligence mm -hmm. for instance? Well, and, and mm -hmm. is there a need for I mean there's a lot of discussion about data sovereignty, for mm -hmm. instance, or indigenous data sovereignty. Is that something that comes up also in, in Taiwan? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I think the the Lanyu, the Orchid Island people, uh, try to issue their local money uh, using uh, Ethereum, uh, but um, Ethereum at that time doesn't have uh, the soulbound tokens, which I'm working on with Vitalik. Uh, going to interview him tomorrow uh, on this. Uh, so uh, without a native on-chain way to represent uh, the indigenous idea 
of uh, meaningful participation to the community. Um, or, or um, I don't know how to call that in the Archaea language. I, after all, I don't know all 16 languages. Anyway, but, but for the Ataya, you be Gaya. Uh, so so uh, a part, it's like the South African, African idea of Ubuntu, right? Uh, I, uh, so it's not that groups are, uh, are, are assemblies of individuals. It's the other way around. One become an individual as a meaningful intersection of our contribution to the various groups. Uh, so, so, and, and that's a that's a fundamental insight, uh, and and that's not there uh, in Ethereum or Bitcoin community <laughs> at the time that RK Islanders uh, did, did their uh, local coins, right? So, at the end of the day, it become like people who buy the wallets, um, you know, buy the wallets. Uh, later on, we will see this dynamic on NFT, which may not be fungible but is transferable. So, anyone with the most money. And just win the NFT game and it become uh, just serving uh, the need of uh, showing your status across lockdowns, uh, which is, I guess, something that's worth paying for for some people. <laughs> but it's as far from indigenous uh, communal spirit as you can get. So so it's not a good fit is what I'm saying. So uh, what, what we're uh, trying to do is to find the um, again, asking the technology to fit the society, not adapting the society to, to fit how Bitcoin work or how Ethereum work or how national identity cards work, which is ultimately about individual sovereignty, which is not a good map <laughs> to the culture. So uh, so we, we really want something like soulbound tokens or nowadays we call it decentralized society, DSOX, uh, to, to actually work. Uh, and uh, when that works, I think we'll have much better uh, social substrate on top of which uh, to grow, uh, like the, the um, dawn of civilization uh, style, uh, new ways of social arrangements and so on. Uh, but uh, we first need to upgrade uh, the internet from a just internet of things uh, and uh, internet protocol addresses uh, into a true internet of beings. Uh, and we're not done uh, do that yet. So we need to focus on that in the next couple of years. Um. Again, feel free to yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Ta. I, I really like your presentation there. Uh, Internet of from Internet of Things to Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it includes the dog, so the dog yeah, agrees yeah. too. Our, yeah. Our family member. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was wondering, Minister Ta, the old. Mm -hmm. Earlier about collaborative mm -hmm. and some of these meetings in data sets, for example, across sector, mm -hmm. and then trying to address could be addressed using some of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so uh, sorry, I, I didn't get the last uh, sentence. Uh, it could be what? You see the data sets which used to be uh, across sectors and then... It could be used to... Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, what the Ministry of Digital Affairs uh, will help do uh, is to... Uh, organized to to design and run uh, the presidential hackathon which is uh, the institution uh, support for the kind of cross-sectoral data we call it coalitions uh, but you can also call it data collaborative I think that's the term that GovLab uses uh, and uh, so uh, I just changed that to say data collaborative anyway uh, so <laughs> the Ministry of <laughs> Digital Affairs uh, proud uh, organizer of next year's presidential hackathon um, is the, um, the kind of um, proponent of co-creation of this map, for example, uh, which measure air quality PM 2.5, but you can't really tell which sector contributed which. Uh, many of these are in the education sector, uh, where the 
primary schoolers are learning about data stewardship based on the Arduino or Raspberry stations that they put forward on their balcony or whatever that determines whether their parents uh, walk to a nearby uh, market or have to uh, go in a bus or a car because of the PM 2.5 pollution level. Uh, so they contribute meaningfully to their family. But uh, on this area, which is the industrial park area, it is done by the municipal government because they own the lamps, uh, public lamps in those industrial areas and the teachers can't really break in and install air boxes and so on. So basically we work on the protocol. We work on the distributed ledger that holds everyone to account. We work with the National Center for High Speed Computation, which is a part of the Ministry uh, and uh, soon Council uh, uh, Commission of National Science and Technology. So we work with NSTC and MODA together to ensure that uh, the even primary schoolers have the computation power to test their alternative models of how those things work. And this is what we call data competence, not just literacy, where they uh, learn about the inferences of the models, but competence, uh, the freedom to fork the models so that they can uh, build their own hypothesis and so on. Uh, and every year, we work with the presidential office to give five awards, that's just like this, uh, to the winners a presidential hackathon. And uh, here is a micro projector. I don't know whether you can see it underneath the, the shape of Taiwan. And if you turn on the micro projector, it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, handing you the trophy. So, so this is very meta, like this, this trophy literally describes itself. Uh, and then you see Dr. Tsai Ing-wen on that projection, promising whatever you did in the past three months locally will become national policy uh, with the funding, personnel and regulation required. So this is how we select presidential annual agenda, partly uh, with crowdsourcing. Uh, and the data collaboratives built this way, of course, need to prove its value to pretty, pretty much everyone. Uh, and the way that they surface themselves is to lobby uh, for votes. Now, I, I don't have time to go into details, but we use a new voting system called quadratic voting. Uh, so all the projects need to declare publicly which of the 169 uh, sustainable development goals uh, that they correspond to, or at least one of the 17 uh, initially. Uh, so it must be a public good. And now we're all public goods, 200 different projects. Each citizen in Taiwan, actually everyone with a local SMS number, received 99 points, which you can allocate. Uh, and then it's uh, if you vote one vote to a project, it's one point cost two votes, four points, three votes, nine points, the quadratic. With 99 points, you can only vote nine votes to your favorite pet project, uh, 81. And you have 18 left, so you will vote, instead of squandering them, four votes to something else. Uh, so learn more about SDGs in the process. You still have two left, so vote four, right? So on average, people vote for four or more projects. Maybe they do a seven and seven or whatever. Uh, by the end of the day, we have the statistics that we want, so that when we choose the top 20, to incubate, not only everyone feel they have won because they've supported probably one of the 20, but also the other 200 feel also they have won because they can uh, just um, reallocate their energy to the top 20 that has the most synergy with them because uh, the quadratic voting patterns. Uh, and so everybody wins afterwards. So this is how a uh, new mechanism design can turn a zero or negative sum game of voting, internet voting on your popular pet project. It used to be the most divisive of things uh, into something that's genuinely co-creative and finally leads to decisive uh, policy. And if you want to learn more, just type presidential hackathon. Very easy to remember branding. Um, thank you for your question. Hope that answered your question. And uh, yeah, there's always an international version of that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. On, on, uh, yes. And yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, on the net zero uh, in practice. So uh, instead of all 17, the international track focused on the only thing of the 17 uh, that is equally felt because carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases doesn't know jurisdictional boundaries, unlike the other SDG goals. Uh, so we focus on the 13 uh, for our uh, international track. Cool. Wonderful. Well, I'm sensitive to your time, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe you're a busy person. So uh, you've given us an hour, which was a true privilege. And, um, um, and you've given us a lot of um, um, links here as well that we will follow up. Is there another way of, that people can follow uh, mm -hmm. recent developments uh, uh, working on? 
No. Well, my Twitter, my Twitter, maybe, <laughs> uh, like li literally follow. Uh, I think it's uh, still in the nightlife district, uh, but not as loud as right. Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to fix that uh, somehow. But uh, great. Well, thanks so much, everyone, mm -hmm. uh, for joining. Uh, and other feel free to attend, but I'm sure you have other uh, on Monday as well. And uh, again, uh, wonderful remainder of the week and thanks again Audrey. Thank you, thank you. Live long and prosper. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye, -bye.